You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. Folks, tonight is probably going to awaken you more than any broadcast that I've ever done. Don't you dare go away from your radio for not even one second tonight. There will be no commercials, for this is of such utmost importance. I remember... Many months ago, I did a broadcast relating the contents of an interview in a book entitled 5-5-2000 by a man named Richard Noon. The man being interviewed stated that Jesus had done his job, and now it is Lucifer's turn. I take you to the secret places of the lion. Ladies and gentlemen, everything you hear tonight will be direct quotes from the writings, from their own words, of the perpetrators. Now remember, from the Mystery Babylon series, the Illuminati is the plural for illumined, are those of the light. Freemason in French literally means the sons of light. The Illuminati are the full body of initiates of the highest degrees of all of the different branches and orders of the philosophers of fire, the secret societies. I quote to you now from a book entitled, The History of Freemasonry and Masonic Digest, embracing an account of the order from the building of Solomon's Temple, its progress hence throughout the civilized world, and the introduction of modern degrees called Masonic, and the first written history of Masonry in the United States, to which are added the old charges and ancient regulations, as collated by order of the Grand Lodge of England in 1722. Also, the Spurious Laws is published by Dermot, a code of Masonic jurisprudence illustrated by the author's answers to questions of law and usage, a dictionary of Masonic terms, description of Masonic jewels, regalia, etc., 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 by J.W.S. Mitchell, M.D., past Grand Master, past Grand High Priest, and past Exalted Commander of Missouri. Volume 2, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, American Publishing House, 1888. And I begin quoting from page 209. Listen very carefully, ladies and gentlemen. About the middle of the 17th century, a society styling itself the Rosicrucians, our brothers of the Holy Cross, was instituted in Germany, made up of visionary chemists, who soon became very numerous and were quite as extravagant in their claims to a knowledge of miracles as are the life or the live forevers of the 19th century. We hope we shall not trample the toes of thy brother in writing truthfully about the Rosicrucians for admitting the Rose Cross degree of the so-called modern masonry to have originated as above. We suppose it has been modified somewhat to suit the times. We know not whether, in the great batch of degrees given to us, we received the Rose Cross, but certain it is, we know something of its teachings, and we claim the right 
to give to our readers the authenticated facts touching the history of the Rosicrucians. The members of this society claimed to be learned philosophers in search of the alchemy of life and the philosopher's stone. These enthusiasts are impostors pretended to be in possession of many great and valuable secrets by the use of which they could transmute certain base metals into pure gold, prolong life through an infinitude of years, make the old grow younger until in the bloom of youth they were prepared for eternal life and perfect felicity on earth. The Rosicrucians were strictly a secret society. They lived so completely in retirement that they acquired the name of the Invisible Brothers. Some are of opinion that Illuminism originated with the Rosicrucians. Of the Illuminati, we have already spoken at length in noticing the writings of Berul and Robinson. But we may add here that if we follow them from their first appearance in Spain in 1575, to their introduction into France in 1634, to their revival in Germany by Weishaupt in 1774, and finally to their exposure growing out of a quarrel amongst themselves in 1787 and their supposed connection with the Jacobin clubs in the early part of the French Revolution. And along with this train of observation, if we inquire after the enemies of Masonry, we shall find them employed in pointing out the anti-religious views of Illuminism and attributing these infidel principles to the Masonic Society. It was openly avowed by Dr. Weishaupt that Illuminism was opposed to civil governments, contending that an enlightenment by education of the masses would do away with the necessity of penal laws and make reason the God to be worshipped. And as the Illuminati were understood to be a secret society, it was not very unnatural for very many weak-minded or mischief-making persons to identify Masonry with Illuminism. And thus it was that by many they were esteemed as being one and the same thing, although it was then, as now, susceptible of proof that while Illuminism made war upon the Bible, Masons worshipped only through its inspired pages that while Illuminism designed the pulling down all civil governments, Masonry taught and required its members to live peaceable citizens, obedient to the government under which they lived, eschewing religion and politics as subjects for discussion in their lodges. But after all, with shamefacedness, we are called upon to admit that there is some respectable testimony going to show that during the French Revolution of 1798, the Illuminati and Jacobin clubs each exercised a pernicious influence over some of the Masonic lodges of Paris. Indeed, it seems probable that these political and anti-religious societies not only sent their members into the Society of Freemasons, but in a few instances they obtained control of the lodges and thus arose the seemingly well-founded charge that Masonry and Illuminism walked hand in hand, not only in overthrowing the government, but to the end that anarchy and misrule should crown their efforts, as heretofore stated, true Freemasonry never was connected with Illuminism, but that system called Scotch Rite, or ineffable Masonry, was. Now let me say that again, from the mouth of one of their own, a very highly degreed, past exalted Grand Master of the State of Missouri. As heretofore stated, true Freemasonry never was connected with Illuminism, but that system called Scotch Rite, or ineffable Masonry, was.
Oh, yes, they are roaring. And while you all watch on your television sets every Sunday morning, the so-called evangelical Christians calling the Christian disparate groups to unify. As you watch the World Council of Churches twist the teachings and the dogma of the churches into one. As you listen to the Pope call for the unification of all Christian churches under the leadership of the Vatican, with the Pope at the head. As you see Pat Robertson tell you that this is a good idea, then you will understand what I am about to read to you. This, ladies and gentlemen, is called Living Ideas in America, edited with commentary by Henry Steele Comager, Harper and Brothers Publishers, New York. And the copyright, if I can find it, is uh, 1951 by Henry Steele Comager, printed in the United States of America. And on page 517, it publishes an interesting paper called The Socialization of Christianity. And listen very carefully. The Socialization of Christianity. The interest of Protestant churches in the work of social reform goes back to the pre-Civil War years when men like Channing, Emerson, Parker, and others of the Unitarian denominations were so active. The movement, formally called the Socialization of Christianity, developed in the closing years of the 19th and the early years of the 20th century. While basically the same as the earlier movement, it was wide in scope and perhaps more realistic. The Catholic Church, traditionally a social service as well as a spiritual agency, had concerned itself increasingly with problems of economy and society. We give here the statement of the General Conference of the Federal Council of Churches in 1932 and the statement of the National Catholic Welfare Conference. The Federal Council of Churches evolved into the World Council of Churches. This conference officially represented the Catholic hierarchy of 1938. This statement, prepared by the most reverend Edwin O'Hara, is a resume of the principles which may be regarded as basic to the development of a Christian social order in a democratic society. Now remember, I told you, Whenever you hear the word democratic, it means really socialistic. And here it is. The social creed of the churches. The churches should stand for, one, practical application of the Christian principle of social well-being to the acquisition and use of wealth, subordination of speculation, and the profit motive to the creative and cooperative spirit. Do you understand what that means? I hope so. Here's number two. Social planning and control of the credit and monetary systems and the economic processes for the common good. Three, the right of all to the opportunity for self-maintenance, a wider and fairer distribution of wealth, a living wage as a minimum, and above this just a share for the worker in the product of industry and agriculture. Four, safeguarding of all workers, urban and rural, against harmful conditions of labor and occupational injury and disease. Five, social insurance against sickness, accident, want in old age, and unemployment. Six, reduction of hours of labor as the general productivity of industry increases, release from employment at least one day in seven with a shorter working week in prospect. Seven, such special regulation of the conditions of work of women as shall safeguard their welfare and that of the family and the community. Eight, the right of employees and employers alike to organize for collective bargaining and social action. Protection of both and the exercise of this right. The obligation of both to work for the public good, encouragement of cooperatives and other organizations among farmers and other groups. Nine, abolition of child labor adequate provision for the protection, education, spiritual nurture, and wholesome recreation of every child. Ten, protection of the family by the single standard of purity, educational preparation for marriage, homemaking, and parenthood. 
11. Economic justice for the farmer in legislation, financing, transportation, and the price of farm products as compared with the cost of machinery and other commodities which he must buy. 12. Extension of the primary cultural opportunities and social services now enjoyed by urban populations to the farm family. 13. Protection of the individual and society from the social, economic, and moral waste of any traffic in intoxicants and habit-forming drugs. 14. Application of the Christian principle of redemption to the treatment of offenders. Reform of penal and correctional methods and institutions and of criminal court procedure. 15. Justice, opportunity, and equal rights for all. Mutual goodwill and cooperation among racial, economic, and religious groups. 16. Repudiation of war. Drastic reduction of armaments. Participation in international agencies for the peaceable settlement of all controversies. The building of a cooperative world order. 17. Recognition and maintenance of the rights and responsibilities of free speech, free assembly, and a free press. The encouragement of free communication of mind with mind as essential to the discovery of truth. That's the social creed of the churches in 1932. B. A Christian social order. 1. That industrial and financial power must not be divorced from social responsibility. Those exercising such power must always have in view the good of the industry or business as a whole, and also the common good. Two, that a prominent aim of industry should be to provide stable employment so as to eliminate the insecurity and the other social ills that arise from excessive changes of employment and residence. Three, that as machinery is introduced into industry, workers thereby displaced should be guaranteed adequate protection. Four, that employment should be available for workers at not less than a family living income. Five, that a Christian social order in America will look forward to some participation by employees in profits and management. Six, that a wide distribution of ownership of productive property should be encouraged by legislation. Seven, that there should be limitations of hours of labor in keeping with human need for rest and relaxation. This is especially true in regard to the labor of women and young persons. The industrial employment of children outside of the family should be prohibited. Eight, that monopoly should be controlled in the public interest. Nine, that collective bargaining through freely chosen representatives be recognized as a basic right of labor. Ten, that minimum wage standards be set up by law for labor unprotected by collective bargaining. Eleven, that the legitimacy of the profit motive and the development and conduct of business be frankly recognized and its control in the interest of the common good should not aim at its extinction. Twelve, that there must be an increase of wealth produced if there is to be an adequate increase of wealth distributed. Thirteen, that a proper objective of monetary policy is to avoid rapid and violent fluctuations in commodity price levels. 14. That after a man has given his productive life to industry, he should be assured of security against illness and dependent old age. 15. That a balance must be maintained between industrial and agricultural population and between the rewards for industrial and agricultural activity. 16. That a healthy agricultural system will encourage the family farm rather than the commercial farm. 17. That a Christian social order involves decent housing for all the people. 18. That the family rather than the individual is the social and economic unit and its needs should be recognized both by industry and by the state. 20. That a Christian social order organized on the basis of self-governing industries, occupations, and professions according to the plan proposed by Pius XI and is encyclical on reconstructing the social order will establish social justice and promote industrial peace. 21 that a Christian social order can be maintained only on the basis of a full acceptance of the person and the teachings of Jesus Christ. Beyond the enunciation of these principles, we are charged with the further responsibility of translating them into action, National Catholic Welfare Conference Statement 1938. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there are some good things in there that would help everybody an awful lot. There is also the distinct and unmistakable thread of Marxist socialism and communism in those statements. My point is this. In my series on the mysteries, Mystery Babylon, I pointed out 
that at the highest levels, ladies and gentlemen, the Lodge is no different than the Church or the Vatican, and the result, if any of them gain control of the world or the nation, will be exactly the same. I also documented, and so did Piers Compton in his book, entitled The Broken Cross, The Infiltration and the Occupation of the Vatican by Highly Degreed Members of the Mysteries. In one great religion that has many members and covers the world and is strong here in the United States, in their ceremony in their church, which they call a temple, until just recently, when it was exposed and it was changed. At one point, the congregation would call for God, and their God would answer, but it was always Lucifer. Lucifer. I respect everybody's right to worship at whatever altar they wish, so I will not name the church. This is from a book entitled Deliverance by J.F. Rutherford. It's published by the International Bible Students Association Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Jehovah's Witnesses. On the title page under the title Deliverance, I quote, a vivid description of the divine plan, particularly outlining God's progressive steps against evil and showing the final overthrow of the devil and all of his wicked institutions, the deliverance of the people, and the establishment of the righteous government on earth. And on page 14, under the heading of Lucifer, well... I'll hold you in suspense for just a little bit. bet you're really confused now, aren't you? Well, I hope so. But I'm going to clear it all up, never fear, before this broadcast is over. You will see the light. Under the heading Lucifer, amongst the mighty creatures of Jehovah God is the one first called Lucifer. His name means light bearer or morning star. God's prophet speaks of him as the son of the morning. It would be difficult to find words more, destruct, more descriptive of beauty. It would be difficult to find words more descriptive of beauty. He belonged to the heavenly realm and was therefore in the holy kingdom of God, and the description of him shows that he was shining forth amongst the others of that glorious place. This description indicates that he was more showy than the other creatures of heaven. Of him it is written that every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created, 
Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. Now that song, ladies and gentlemen, doesn't mean anything that you heard. It's all in symbolism. Our trio is doomed, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I could go on, but I must leave something for you. You see, you must learn to exercise your brain. 